Randy, the people watching this are going to want the nitty gritty. Um, what do you consider to be the biggest mistakes that a punter can make to not be a winning punter? Probably, I think getting their staking wrong more than anything else. You, you often hear pro punters say, you know, you've, you've got to have the discipline and, and pro, try, try not to get too carried away with a winning a winning day or a winning selection or a, a big win. Um, I've always tended to bet pretty much flat line across my betting life, i.e. my stakes haven't really gone up that much. I tend to have more on, of course, than I used to when I, I didn't have a reasonable amount of money behind me. But that just goes with the territory. But I don't feel as though I've, my betting patterns have changed, i.e. I stick to the same stakes. If, I, if I've had a brilliant day yesterday, I don't think, right, oh, I'm going to play this up now and you know because I had a hundred quid on that one I won two grand I'm gonna have a grand on the next one if if I won a hundred if I won two grand by staking a hundred quid my next stake is still a hundred quid stick to the same routine stick to the thing that you know you're comfortable with stick in, in, in your own sort of like parameters I think a lot of punters probably try and get their head of themselves they feel as they're gonna win a million quid every day I think if you're gonna be in it for, for the long game you've got to you have got to have that kind of mindset. You 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 certainly, you certainly don't want to be uh, you know walking before you can run. Um, and I've that's what I've done. I've, I've basically just kept to the same staking plan along the way. Look, I'll I'll say right, this is half a point win. This is a point win, and that's a five point maximum. So if you've got then got a, a staking plan across that naught to five scale, try and stick with it because I think if you if you're just all over the place, depending on how your mood is or if your last one's just lost and you think, right, I'm going to have more on this one now to try and get out on the next one. I think that's another thing as well. Trying to get out on on the next one, on the next one, on the next one. That's when the problems really, really become quite... Um, they, t they tend to escalate. Right, now, you talked about staking. Now, I don't expect you to tell us your exact figures, but you mentioned £100 and you mentioned grands. Which would be the nearest figure to your per-point stake? I, on a, on a, if I fancy something really strongly... Um, obviously, I've got my own ways of getting on. It's difficult to get onto reasonable amounts nowadays. Um, you know, you can't, you know, stake to win a five grand or something like that. Most firms that, that allow me to bet through their, their site would have a limit of say a grand or fifteen hundred quid. But obviously, I've got other ways of getting on as well. Other people get on for me. On, a, on, if I fancy, the, funny enough, the bigger the price I see, or the the, the more potential I've got to, uh, of making a few quid out of something, I think is the wrong price. Is the more I have on, I won't have more on a short one, which is another mistake I think a lot of punters make. If there's a six to four shot, they seem more comfortable having more on a, a short one, whereas that's not really going to change their life. Whereas you should be having more on the bigger price ones, and I'd probably be looking at anything between five hundred and a thousand. If there was a twenty to one shot. That I thought should be eight, or even shorter. That's the one I'm going to try and make the most money on because that's going to change my that's going to change my month, going to change my year. Um, whereas uh, I'd kick myself for having a, a huge amount of money on a five to four shot. Right, you're going to elaborate a bit more about this getting on business mm -hmm. because people would be watching this saying, you know, how, how would you how could you possibly get those sort of bets on? Have you got bookmakers that sort of do you a special deal for marking their card? Yeah, there's um, there's three firms that I pl I play with that um, they use me as a as a, a marker, as it were, a marker account. Um, so obviously they want they want to know what I'm backing beforehand. Um, but like I said, I'll give you a cap with it. They won't say right, you've just got a free hand here. Um, no bad each way bets as well. I'll add in that. I think you come to a gentleman's agreement that. You know, an eight run a novice hurdle and there's a three to one second favourite, you're not going to be having a monkey each way on. You know, straight away, they'll just look at that and sort of close your account. So I think you've also got to make sure you play the game fairly and squarely with them as well and, and just bet in normal, reasonable um, circumstances. Um, obviously, the exchanges as well. Um, I use um, um, one reputable exchange, um, which has got a reasonable amount of liquidity in the morning. Unfortunately, it doesn't usually work for me in my favour because most of my activity is done between half eight and nine o'clock before my bets go out that's when I'm trying to get on so trying to get the bets on the exchanges early doors when there's only a few pence and tuppence there is a bit difficult so you kind of have to sometimes take slightly under what it what it might be uh, if it's like 5.1 you might have to go down to 4.95 to, to get on um, 
but in the, in the long term, then it still makes a profit. It's still profitable. Now, you're not the first professional punter to tell us that they've got the red carpet for a few firms. It must be that that must be the easy way to riches working on one of those trading floors where you shrewdies ring it up. Yeah, it's it's kind of like a, a a badge of honour, isn't it? In many respects, it's good and bad. You you feel as though you've you've done well at your job. You're you've the tra- the traders have basically wiped the hands of you and they've said right, we don't want to take any more money, which is which is great for the ego, but it doesn't really help you in the long run because it's another firm you can't bet with. In the good old days when I had. You know, 10, 15 firms to bet with. It was just a matter of just, oh, I can, I can use him today and I can use him today. And it was just great. You know, it was just like finding money in the street. Um, but nowadays, yeah, it's it's a lot, it is more difficult to get on, of course. But I've tended to kind of like be a little bit more relaxed with it as well. I can see why a lot of punters are up in arms about being knocked back and kicked back because they're taking the wrong prices and it's unfair and what have you. I've I've been there and done that now. I kind of got the t-shirt with it. It's I, I try, I've got more important things to worry about in my life about, you know, winning x amount of money and cause just because I can't get on, I'm not like you know, tearing my hair out, walking around the room screaming and cursing. It, it it is what it is, isn't it? Um, you you deal with it. You find ways of getting on, and I just think nowadays I'm happy just to win my my few quid each each day, each week, and and as long as I'm making a reasonable living, then that that that'll do for me now. Okay, so we need a few um, figures, quick figures off you. What would have been in a, roughly your best day? Uh, my best day was when number six Valverde won the Grand National. I've actually got a photo of it somewhere around in, in the office, but I can't move the camera. But uh, yeah, he, he he was a horse that I, I spotted the year before, I ran well in the Irish National, and, and the trend was very much probably 10 years ago that the Irish horses were very well handicapped in the, in the English National. Um, particularly the ones that have run well in that race and of course number six Valverde had won it he'd won the Irish National the year before and I couldn't believe his price it was, it was like I say it was in an era where they, they were the Irish horses were still underestimated um, and this horse was like available to back at 40 to 1 a horse that had proven itself in a 30 run race in Ireland in a fast time um, he was trained by Martin Brazzard again another trainer that wasn't high up on most punters um, um, you know, short list, and the two, the two combination of the being the small trainer, uh, under the radar horse, and the price, I, I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. He was like forty to one, thirty three to one anti post. So I, I backed him basically all the way through the, through the uh, the winter months. Uh, he won the, I think he won the Thiestis Chase as well, um, on one of his prep runs, and he also ran out of hurdles. Martin did the. That they, they went through the tried and trusted formula of keeping this horse's handicap mark down the old Irish system of running it in a chase and then running it in two handicap hurdles to keep its handicap mark down. So everything worked out. I think he went off 10 or 8 to 1 on the day, got a lovely run round, and all the way around I kept thinking he, he was going to win. I never felt as though he was going to make a mistake or do anything wrong. And it was just one of those unbelievable days where the, 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 it was the perfect storm. I got the price. I, I'd. I'd you know, done all the homework, all the groundwork, and you need a huge amount of luck, of course, in the Grand National for it to come off. But that was the the biggest feeling of euphoria I ever had, of almost like telling everyone this horse was going to win the Grand National and it actually doing it. And um, yeah, I made a nice few quid out of that that day. It was lovely. What about the day when it went horribly wrong? Day when it went horribly wrong. There's been quite a few of those. Um, I can I could probably say, in 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 collection. A year, many years ago at Cheltenham, I actually never backed a winner at all at Cheltenham. My good friend Sam Turner will be uh, here to back me up as well on that. Um, it was the year when a horse called Upgrade won the Triumph Hurdle. I think we're going back to the 90s. And I actually put Sam onto this horse, Upgrade, and he backed Upgrade. And for some reason or another, I I, I didn't back him. I was going to back it on the day because I'd had such a bad week. The Triumph Hurdle was on the last day and I'd... Cut my nose off to spite my face, having fancied upgrade all the way along, didn't back it, went on something else, upgrade won the triumph hurdle. It was the final nail in the coffin. I'd had loser after loser after loser, and I was 28 losers down by the end of the day, and upgrade had won the triumph hurdle. I walked out of Cheltenham that night feeling suicidal. It was horrible. Uh, luckily, I haven't had a year like that ever, ever again since. Uh, and I think when the week starts at Cheltenham, I'm always thinking, I hope this is not going to be another upgrade year where I don't have any winners, because there's nothing worse than not having a winner at the Island Festival. So that was definitely my worst moment or worst feeling in racing. 
All right, something that would probably make you feel a bit better. What would you? What would be your rough estimate? What what you've won in your lifetime? How much I've won in my lifetime? Oh my goodness me! Well, um, I suppose you'd have to add in houses and all the cars and bits and pieces. But yeah, we're, we're it's, it's got to be in, in into close to a million. It's got to be. Um, I think it's quite embarrassing talking about it, really. But yeah. I, Obviously, there's been they've spent so much money over the years in in various things. It's almost impossible to put a figure on. But yeah, easily easily a million. Right, we've got four minutes left, and though people watching this want to win win a million as well, so tips, basic tips on how a novice punter can improve the game, <laughs> improve their game. I would say for someone coming into it now, it's almost impossible to try and keep up with racing on a daily basis. I try and do so. I try and do it more predominantly because. I like to have a broad spectrum from my tipping perspective and obviously my media work as well. I can't go and work for William Hill Radio and not talk about a selling race at Brighton because I haven't watched it or I haven't done any homework. Um, so I, I tend to have to train myself to, to, to be a, a jack of all trades. But I certainly wouldn't advise that. I think if you are coming into the game now, because there's so much on, you've got to try and specialise. Okay, I think you've got to... I'd, I'd either go down the two-year-old route on the flat, follow the two-year-olds, because I do think they offer a good source of um, uh, winner finding and also as I said before in the previous um, piece novice hurdles are a very good source okay right. brief do's and don'ts of form study don't cut corners I think a lot of people think it's it's easy and it isn't and I think if you cut corners in this game you'll get found out um, you've got to put the work in you've got to watch the race and you've got to go back and watch the videos Watch them two or three times over. Try and spot something that everybody else has spotted. I got. I often, if I get a race where I think it's a good race on the time figures, I'll go back and watch horses that finish down the field, whether they ran against the bias, if there was a track bias that day, if the inside of the track was slower than the middle or the outside. Look for horses that ran well despite being drawn on the wrong part of the track. Um, just watch the way they they you know they finished off their race. There's so many things I could talk about and what what and. Sort of give us advice, but ultimately, I say, like I say, a lot, a lot of hard work. Make sure that you, you don't, you don't um, give it due diligence. And do's and don'ts of actually backing them. There's, I think, like I say, I think the staking plan is very important. Um, talked about that. Um, try and have more on the the ones that you should be you should be trying to make a few quid out of. The bigger the price, the more you have on. Um, and Try not to try not to um, focus on one day in particular. I think a lot of people punters fall foul of trying to get you hear, hear it, don't you, in the pubs and clubs afterwards. Oh, that got me out of trouble for the day. I think if you just deal with one day and blend it into the next, the whole the whole thing becomes a whole year round thing rather than just a day and how that affects your mind. Because you, if you just say, look look back on one day in particular. Your mind gets scrambled. You've had a bad day yesterday. Yes, it's all about that day, isn't it? Whereas you just completely eradicate it from your mind and just move on and just keep try and keep flowing, keep flowing, rather than just concentrating on little segments. One day, one day, one day. Okay, and finally, one golden rule. If punters going to remember anything, remember the one rule to try and be successful. Trust your judgment. Trust your judgment. Trust your instinct. If you've got an instinct for the game. But yeah, trust your judgment. Um, we've all had bad ones. We've talked about that before. If you're, if you can find something that gives you an, an angle or an edge, which I, I, hopefully I've, I've I've got with the, with the times, then try and stick to that. Try not to you know to move outside of that. Um, try not to do too many things, um, and try and restrict your betting as well. Try not to have too many recreational bets. Um, I think that's an important thing as well. Don't go. You know, oh, I'm just going to have a fiver each way because it's the Gold Cup. Oh, it's a champion. Oh, I'm just going to have a daft bet here. Stick to stick to your system, and hopefully, you should make it pay in the long term.